Kent's updated. I'll start again. The Kent's updated its planning policy framework in order to better address the key priorities of the council, in particular the climate and ecological, ecological emergencies. We're updating parts of our core strategy and plan, place making plan. The local plan parcel update, preparing three supplementary planning documents on transport and development, housing market occupation, and energy efficiency, retrofitting, and sustainable construction. As part of our commitment to giving people a bigger say, we have published on 27th August these key draft documents for consultation. It's really important that you take the opportunity to submit your comments, which be carefully considered and help influence our policies. The updated policies are crucial as they will help shape the future development and change in our area. Today's session will release a series of webinars that we've arranged in order to explain some of the key policy updates and changes and outline how you can engage in the process and submit your comments. It's also an opportunity to ask questions of our officers and help record the responses. The officer will now take over and make a presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you for um, for taking the time to uh, to come and hear our hear our presentation. Um, so as as uh, Dave and Tim have said, well, this is uh, this is a specific session covering the um, the transport um, elements of it. So that includes the local plan policy updates and the transport and development SPD. Um, my name is Chris Carter. I'm um, working as part of the um, the transport policy team um, at Baines, and um, my uh, and I'll be taking through the uh, for the presentation. So I think the first point is, is why are we why are we making these um, changes to transport policy through the, um, the local plan update and the uh, and, and the SPD? Um, I mean we have to see everything through the climate and ecological emergency lens. So that's obviously declared in 2019. Um, and it's it's clear from the work that done as part of that that we need to act fast um, and we need to, to make transport significantly more sustainable. Um, and we cannot carry on with, uh, with, with business as usual. So our target is to be carbon neutral by 2030. Um, now transport accounts for 29% of um, carbon emissions within Baines. Um, so clearly that's a major area where we need to make improvements. Um, and as part of that, we, uh, we first we need to reduce the mileage that everyone travels by, by vehicle um, by about 25%. Um, following on from that, we need to make the vehicle travel that we use cleaner. Um, so we need to be making 90% um, of our vehicles to be what we're calling ultra low emissions vehicles. Um, now that's an electric vehicle, which we want to be about 76% of our fleet, um, or a hybrid vehicle, um, which is uh, about 14%. So that leaves 10% of vehicles on the road to be powered by internal combustion engine, so petrol or diesel, effectively. Um, there's a whole load of ways that transport policy can also um, contribute towards better health, well-being, safety, security, and uh, and also inequalities, um, and that's um, and that's a, those are key elements of um, of what we're trying to do with with, with transport policy, um, and it's important to say that transport is key to creating the better place that we want to um, that we that we want this district to be. Um, so what are we doing? Um, so um, through changes to the uh, LPPU policies, so that's ST1 to ST8, which cover uh, various aspects of, um, of transport and development. Um, and uh, so we're updating those policies. Um, and we're also produced, we've produced a, a um, guide, uh, an SPD, which is a supplementary planning document. And what that does is it provides the in-depth guidance on how we expect um, transport and development to come forward sustainably within the following topic areas, walking, cycling, Traffic, travel plans, ultra low emissions vehicles, and parking. Now, this isn't every single aspect of transport. It's um, guidance on, on these particular topics. And everything else is, uh, is driven by the overarching policies within the, uh, the, the local plan partial update. Um, and the main things we're doing within this is we're strengthening the focus on sustainable travel. And it's about providing travel choices. So giving people alternatives to car, um, to car usage and reducing their, reducing car dependency. Um, and we want to make it clear um, the expectations that we have from developments um, in through the planning process. Um, and in doing so, we, we make sure that the, the quality of planning submissions increases. And importantly, with the council officers in how that they ensure that development is delivered sustainably and making sure that they have a good footing within which to, uh, to, to increase the standards of development. 
Um, so this is, this is section is effectively a summary of um, some of the aspects of the local plan partial update that we are changing. So SD1 is the policy, overarching policy regarding promoting sustainable travel. And we're, again, we're, we're strengthening that policy and we're adding some elements. Now, the key headlines for that is that um, the, we're emphasising the importance of the location, like effectively being near to local facilities, being near to public transport interchanges. Um, that is the key driver in how we encourage, how we give people um, sustainable travel opportunities. So the actual choice of site is incredibly important. Um, and then we're also recognising the importance of good design. So it's not simply a case of providing any housing in any location is, 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 is sustainable. We've got to make sure that we're providing those pedestrian cycle routes, that we're, that we're improving the quality of development, we're making it, making it easy for people to travel sustainably and reduce car dependency. And we need that to be available early on. Um, so it needs to, it can't come in too, too late down the line after people have put in their, uh, have already developed travel habits. There needs to be choice early on. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that every sustainable transport measure has to be delivered on day one. But if a site is located um, near, pub, near good public transport, that might be the appropriate thing for, for, for day one. But the improvements to come in as soon in the development process as possible. Um, and we also want to shift the balance of, um, of mitigation in favour of sustainable modes. So that's um, that's making sure that if you if, if you if you generate a lot of traffic and the nearby junction um, is over capacity, rather than building an extra lane into that junction and increasing the capacity of the junction, the first thing that developers need to do is look at is giving people the chance to travel more sustainably, reducing that traffic that develop that traffic generation. That's the first thing we want people to do before they consider increasing traffic capacity. Um, and we're also adding opportunities for, for last mile deliveries. So we've all seen um, white vans going round and round and round residential areas. We want to make sure that that last mile, that people, um, that those goods tra travel um, is, is as sustainable as possible. That might be a, um, a consolidation centre where it works or drop off points in, the, in central parts of developments. That people can walk or cycle or um, have e-cargo e bikes doing those sorts, those those last trips. It will very much depend on the type of development, but that's what we want to make sure that we're we're including. And as these all these points we're carrying through into SC7, which is a more specific policy on managing development. Um, so the other sort of key changes that we've got, um, again, it's the same themes run through. It's about prioritizing mode shift over traffic capacity and supporting sustainable travel when you build traffic capacity schemes. So it cannot simply just be build more traffic, build more traffic capacity, generate more traffic, build more capacity, and go on and go on and on about that. We have to make sure that people have the chance to shift onto, um, onto other modes. Um, and we're updating our traffic management policy to reflect the livable neighbourhood strategy. Um, and also we're supporting temporary trials to in, inform consultation. Um, and those are, um, that's effectively showing people what schemes will be like um, before making decisions or um, on the final design or whether the scheme happens or not. It's showing them over a, over a course of months um, what, what this will look like. Um, we're amending our policy on park and ride to be a more overarching policy on interchange. The, the, the general principle of that is that it, it, if we improve the choice between it's not just drive to a park and ride site and get the bus into town. It's dry, It's uh, take any mode to the site and any mode out of the site. So it could include things like um, e-car, e-car hire, e-bike hire, um, a range of public transport routes. And um, there's a few sort of images on, on the right to see how that sort of thing would happen. Um, with the aim is you're actually increasing the capacity of the site by giving people more of a chance to drive to, to, to travel to and from it rather than just driving one leg of the journey. Um, and as part of that, we'd be incorporating additional um, benefits where, where they're appropriate. So landscape and ecology, trying to get some biodiversity net gain out of some of these sites. Um, and actually, some of these sites are in good locations to be able to give people access to the countryside. So it's not just a commuting um, service, it's, it's getting people in and out. Um, and we can look at energy generation, like solar power. Um, so this image on the, um, 
up here shows um, electric charging coming from um, PVs on the on, on the roof, um, and uh, and there there may be chances to put in kind of more community uses outside peak periods, such as farmers markets. But obviously, we've got to make sure that anything we do under the park and ride or in, under the interchange policy um, conforms with the um, with, with with the general points of uh, what is or isn't acceptable in terms of development. So we wouldn't want a farmers market to generate traffic or draw traffic from a town centre um, or from a local high street. Um, so, the, so that's effectively the, the changes to the LPPU policies. Um, so we are also um, looking at the, the SPD and we've got four topic areas in SPD as I said to start with. Um, and this, I mean, it's a, it's a 150 page document. There's a lot of guidance in here. I've tried to condense um, some of the key messages um, into this presentation. Um, any questions on any of these topic areas, please, um, please let me know and, uh, and we'll endeavour to answer them. Um, so the, the, the point of the walking and cycling guidance is that we want to make, um, we want to make our walking and cycling network safe, resilient and inclusive. Um, we need, it needs to be good enough to enable mass uptake. It can't just be kind of okay for some people who already walk or cycle. It, it's got to be usable for everyone. Um, and this isn't just walking and cycling, although that's the catch-all um, term. It's also what we call micro-mobility, which is any way of, um, of travelling by either on your, under your own power or by a small, um, a, a small machinery. Um, and that includes mobility aids, scooters, wheelchairs, pushchairs, e-bikes, scooters, adapted cycles, cargo bikes, bikes for trailers, um, and probably a whole load more of existing and future technologies. Um, and what there's a lot of there's a lot of very good detailed design guidance. So you might have heard of LTN 120, which was released last year, which is uh, effectively exemplary um, walking um, cycling design. Um, and, uh, and so what, we're not um, we're not reproducing um, what is already a good a, a good section of, of guidance, but we're showing we're setting out what our objectives are for Baines. How does it look? in veins um, and showing what design principles we need to be included, signposting those detailed design standards, making it clear what, um, that we are expecting developments to, to do this on site and off site. We need to look at where the trip starts and where it finishes and that whole route because people don't only travel within developments. They travel to the shops, they travel to schools, they travel to work and that, and that isn't always on within the red line of the development site. Um, and importantly, we're making sure that the um, that planning submissions include the right tools and assessment criteria to demonstrate that this is done. So there will be a checklist within this, which effectively means you have to, to answer each question, signpost to where you've provided the evidence. And that means that's a very clear way of ensuring that um, the developments meet the standards and that we're able to enforce those standards. Um, so just a summary on sort of the design fundamentals. Um, so accessibility, um, which is uh, about inclusivity, but it's also about directness, continuity. Um, so there's some great statistics around um, the number of times that the amount of energy that uh, cyclists expend if they stop your continuous route. So every time you stop and start, you're effectively wasting the energy of, um, of 100 meters worth of cycling. So that's why that's why we want a continuous route so that we're, that we're allowing people to travel further um, within their own personal capabilities. They need to be safe. Um, and that's all sorts of things. There's lighting, natural surveillance. They have to be well designed and you have to feel safe when you use it. Not just be safe uh, statistically, because that's, that's not how, it, how people think. They have to feel safe as well as statistically being safe. Um, and we need it to be comfortable. Um, and that's about width. It's about seating. It's about making sure that we've got enough. If you've got a slope um, running along, um, running along a walking cycle, there needs to be benches. There needs to be places to stop. There needs to be benches. There needs to be bins. It needs to be an attractive environment that people want to be in, um, and it needs to be legible. You need to be able to follow your way through it to actually instinctively guide yourself. Um, right, that's without necessarily needing a map. It needs to be clear, um, and that applies to walking and cycling routes. Um, and uh, so the next topic is travel plans. A travel plan is an operational document, effectively. 
when, when you plan a development and you build a site, you build in the infrastructure, you build in walking cycling routes, you build in bus stops, um, et cetera. Um, but there's also a, a management and a, a behavior change um, management aspect of developments where you, um, you're, you're informing people on what their options are. You're providing them um, taste tickets for public transport. You're monitoring how the, um, how the development is, uh, is operating. Are people traveling the way you were hoping or, or actually are, is there more car dependency? And if so, why? What needs to change? Um, so there's a few different types of travel plan which are sort of set out within this document. And it's the document said, sets up what you need to include. And, um, but we're not being overly prescriptive. It doesn't, if you, if you have a, a menu of X, Y, Z, you have to include X, Y, and Z, then that doesn't necessarily work for an individual, for an individual site. It needs to be clear that you've looked at your own site's characteristic, who are your users, where is the site, where are your opportunities, and make sure that you're tailoring it so that your resources best fit the, um, the, 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 um, the site itself. And, uh, and, and we, we're including a new, a new option, because travel plans have been part of planning policy for some time, um, but we're including a new option um, where you can either, if you're a developer, you can either pay the council to deliver the travel plan, or as a developer, you can continue to deliver it yourself. Um, the, uh, the former option means that you're effectively, you're giving the council, you're paying, paying the council the money it takes to deliver the travel plan. So the benefit for the developer is that they build their, build their site, they sell their homes, and that's, their, that's the end of, of their involvement. Whereas for the, and for the council, it gives us greater level of control, it ensures quality, it ensures consistency. Um, however, we cannot mandate every single uh, developers to do this within the planning process. So there is an option that they can just deliver it themselves. But in that option, we continue to monitor it. So there is a requirement that they submit annual monitoring reports um, and that, that uh, and that we effectively evaluate, they pay us to evaluate how they're doing each year. And if um, if then if the develop the travel plan isn't performing, it's it's not an adversarial process. It's a kind of a let's sit down, let's work out how and, and why. Why isn't it working? What can be done? And in most cases, we would agree a course of remedial action. In some cases, there need, may need to be enforcement, um, but we want to try and avoid that because uh, we want to try and come to solutions. Um, and I mean, it also it's a nuts and bolts document. It shows it, this shows how how the travel plan will be secured. So things like section 106 um, clauses and planning obligations and, and, and that side of that side of the planning. Um, so the next the next topic is ultra emissions vehicles. Um, so our, just to reiterate, our priority is to reduce car usage overall. Um, but the car usage that remains in our network, so we, we understand the characteristics, the characteristics of our um, of our district. It is not all central Bath. It's there's a lot of rural areas. There's a lot of reliance on cars that, it, that is um, is a, a function of the of the locations that people live in. Um, but we want to transition to uh, to a greener fleet. Um, now this SPD applies to um, new developments and it applies to um, to sort of major redevelopments of of sites. Um, and the, the, so it's effectively it sits in a wider strategy of encouraging ULEV uptake. So that's that's central government grants, um, tax incentives, etc. Um, but there's also um, Weka level and Baines level kind of charging strategies, um, effectively setting out charging network of, um, of where people can charge their charge their cars. Um, this is what we're expecting developments to provide. Um, which was supplement a charging network, but also ensure that people, when in their individual trips, get the uh, get the chance to make sure that their cars are uh, are charged. And um, so we're we're providing a lot of information on on the topic area because it is still a relatively new topic area for um, for, for developers and and, and the public. Um, and we're defining um, we're defining standards that uh, people need to provide. So, in short. If you're providing a dwelling with a parking space, there needs to be access to a fast charger. Um, now, if that's, a, if that's an individual home with a driveway, that's one charging space for that driveway. If it's a parking court with, a mul with, multiple, charging, uh, with multiple car parking spaces shared by everyone, then that's charging spaces for that parking court, for each space within that court. Um, and then for non-residential developments, there's going to be some active chargers. So what active means is it's ready to use. 
um, for non-residential developments, so supermarkets, public car parks, etc. Um, and um, as, as well as the level of passive provision, and that what that means is it's providing the under, underlying infrastructure. So it's the electric, it's the, the capacity within the electrical network. It's ducting underneath the spaces, um, and it means that you can come along and you can fit the, fit the active charge point on top. Um, it's slightly more expensive when you come to build the development, but, um, but it's much cheaper when you come to fit the active charge point at the end. So it's a future proofing of uh, of, of of charging. Um, and uh, and then we're also providing principles for um, design and location, which will sort of come on to in the next slide. Um, so the key thing is that different users have different needs. Um, you have a fast charger, which is a seven kilowatt charger, which will typically charge a typical car within eight hours. Now that is what most people use at, use at home. So you, you come home, you plug it in overnight, it's ready to get used again in the next morning. That's that's, that's where a significant proportion of charging happens at people's homes. Um, a rapid charger is, um, is, is much faster. It can typically give you around about 60 to 80% of your car's charge within about 45 minutes. Um, and those are the sorts that you find at motorway service stations. Um, and uh, and so the, the different user types depends on what level of infrastructure you need. So fast is, is, is much more appropriate for your home. Rapid is for motorway service stations, and then you've obviously got workplaces where you, where you tend to stay a bit longer. You've got retail parks where you would probably want a bit of a mix. Um, and and it's um, the, in terms of the principles, we want to make sure that we, there are safeguards in place to avoid um, diesel, petrol, and diesel cars abusing electric vehicle spaces, which is termed icing. Um, and uh, we want to uh, make sure that these. They are still cars. They shouldn't be prioritised over um, over pedestrians and cyclists and, and, and other um, other road users. So we need to make sure that the way the spaces are designed avoid trailing leads. They avoid trip hazards, um, and we're minimising street clutter and we're designing out conflict between different users. Um, so coming on to the final um, final topic of the presentation. Um, is parking policy. Um, now, parking, we've, we've had parking policy within Baines um, for, um, I think, since the placemaking plan in 2017, I think it was. Um, and what we're doing now is, um, is, is, we're trying, we're, is we're updating it. Now, there's one difference in that the parking policy is moving from the development plan, which in this case is the local, local plan partial update, into the SPD. Um, and what we're trying to achieve through parking policy is a number of a number of different things. So it needs to support good placemaking and the design, the amount, the design, the location of parking is uh, is is key to how we how we how our developments come forward. Um, and we need to make sure it's it's allowing people to to um, to up increase usage of cycling. So we need to have the parking cycle parking spaces for them to do so. Um, and that needs to include adaptive cycles. It can't just be standard bikes only. Um, so we're trying to we, we need to control levels of parking in new developments, um, depending on the locations and, and the other opportunities. It, that will vary, um, which we'll come on to in a second. Um, and if we have if we have too much parking, then it doesn't fit with the climate emergency. It encourages unnecessary car usage. It makes it makes that question if you if you're fit an individual you're thinking about your mode of travel unconstrained parking freely available makes you think that is the default option whereas having a bit whereas balancing the, the um your ability to travel between modes i think it, it's um it, it does it so having to having too much parking can encourage people who don't need to drive to do so and it doesn't create a quality environment where for people to um, walk in the cycling or just generally a quality place that people want to be. Um, we're mindful though that if you don't have enough parking, um, then you can create overspill into surrounding areas. Um, it can create haphazard parking, um, so with, with obstructions for, uh, for, for refuse vehicles, delivery vehicles, emergency vehicles. Um, and as, as per the image on the right, you can end up with people parking on the pavement where it's not properly um properly controlled and that obviously impacts on um, other uh, other users of our transport network um so the principles behind our approach to parking standards they um 
these are effectively the general principles, including what's changed or what, what, are, what are we proposing to change. Um, so we're keeping a zonal approach. So the first, the, the first stage in working out what the right level of parking for development is, is, um, is, is where are you in the district? What are your travel opportunities? So before you effectively had, you had inner bath, you had outer bath um, and everywhere else. Um, now what we've done is we've, we've made that a bit, um, we've added an extra zone. So you still get inner bath, you still get outer bath. Um, Cainsham and Saltford come into the outer bath zone because um, they've got similar um, characteristics. Um, and then you've got um, an additional zone, which is the, uh, the towns and villages, which reflects the difference between kind of the, the, the outer bath and the rural areas. So there is that in-between step of, of some, Summer Valley and, um, and, and sort of Whitchurch and Bathampton, those sorts of towns and villages that are, are different to the more rural areas. Um, so that's, the, that, that's effectively the first step in calculating the, uh, the level of parking. You then do an accessibility analysis, which is set out within the SPD, which sort of lo it looks at a very local level of how, like how is your how does how is the accessibility of your particular site rather than just rather than just the area in which you're in, and how should that ref that reflect the level of parking you're providing? Um, we for residences, we are moving away from minimum um, standards into maximum standards, um, and where we can, um, we want to. We want to give people the opportunity to deliver low car developments. Um, but as I said before, we're mindful about over, um, we're mindful about what happens if you under provide parking. So we're very clear on where the conditions are that, that, it, that it works. And that has to be excellent accessibility, which is a, a, a given. Um, and that, that's how you effectively give people opportun um, opportunities to, to car usage. Um, car clubs give you opportun um, opportunities to not necessarily own a car um, and control parking zones reduce the impact on, um, on the surrounding areas. Um, we wanna, we're doing this so we can avoid over provision um, as often happens with, uh, with minimum parking standards. Um, but as I said, it, we're, we're ensuring there's enough parking to limit that risk of overspill. Um, and then for destinations, which um, are things like employment sites, leisure, retail, um, we're keeping those as maximum standards and we've reviewed um, the levels of parking for those maximum standards um, so that we're, um, that we're not over providing car parking. And, and as I said before, we're, we're increasing the levels of cycle parking so that we can, uh, we're not, so that cycle parking doesn't become a barrier to people's deciding to, uh, to cycle. Um, so that effectively is the is the presentation um, as a whole. Um, so I, I will pass back to Dave as chair and um, and potentially Claire um, if we've got any questions within the um, within the chat function that uh, the people have asked. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris, for that presentation. Very interesting. Very informative. Yeah, we do have, I believe, um, some questions have come into the uh, question and answer session section. Uh, George, do you want to read out what the questions are, please? Uh, so, yeah, uh, Claire as well. I think I think Claire's picking up on questions also. So uh, we'll 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 do it together if you like, Claire. <laughs> um, so, sure thing, George. So we've had a question submitted. Uh, and give me a second. I can start while well, you pick up the others, George. We Great, had a question you, yeah. around the Easter Bath Park and Ride. Excuse me. <laughs> and what our plans and approach for that is. So as you know, the Easter Bath Park and Ride, uh, the council looked at various sites and that was um, quite controversial. Um, what we, the approach we've taken through the ad adopted joint local transport plan for is to acknowledge that there's an issue in the east of Bath and that we really need to um, change people's travel behaviours in that area. So what we've committed to doing as a first step is looking at how we improve the walking, cycling and public transport offer over in the east of Bath. Um, and we're currently working with WECA to walk to look at what we call the Wiltshire Whippet, um, which is essentially looking at how we intercept at a small scale level um, 
people traveling from the Wiltshire area over. So first off, we're looking to improve the walking, cycling and public transport offer generally to try and impact and catch some more people. And then we're considering other options, which uh, may include the possibility of um, pocket parking at bus stops. Uh, so rather than a wholesale park and ride, um, which is off the table, we're looking at what other interventions we can do. So it's still a live issue for us. We're just looking at how we might do that differently um, and responding better to the climate emergency in, in how we answer that question. George, is there anything else? Yep, so uh, another question that was submitted uh, before the webinar was in 2011, the government lifted a restriction uh, in, introduced in 2001 on the number of parking spaces allowed in developments of new homes, and it will no longer instruct councils to set high parking charges to encourage use of other transport. Um, so the comment is that the restriction did not deter car ownership. Uh, why might it now? So, uh, would it, and also there's a follow-up, would it not be better to concentrate on making alternatives more attractive? Okay, thank you, George. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's the answer to the second part of the question is that the is, is that we are trying to make alternative modes more attractive. Parking policy is, is one, it's just one part of what we're trying to do as part of this local plan partial update and as part of this transport um, and developments SPD. So we are, um, we are trying to make sure that all of those other all of those other modes are made more attractive. Um, the other point I think is in relation to the, to the first half of the question is so um, as part of when we prepared this uh, this document, there's there's quite a lot of evidence base that kind of sits behind it. There's a couple that are are relevant um, to this particular question. Um, so you've got um, the, the the point about. Um, about whether car ownership work, whether you can influence car ownership by restricting um, number of parking spaces. Now, there was a, um, a piece of, of guidance um, commissioned by the Chartered Institute of Highways Transportation in 2012, um, following this government review, which effectively, can, there were two parts to the conclusion. Um, they effectively showed that where, um, where there's no control in on-street par in, in on parking, that, that attempt to limit car ownership through limiting parking provision effectively doesn't work. Um, so we, we we agree with that side of, of the equation, um, but it also goes on to state that there is clear evidence that limiting provision um, within controlled areas um, where there's less need to travel and greater sustainable travel options is usually matched by lower levels of car ownership. So that's where we're, that, this is the conditions where we're trying to encourage um, low car development. Um, also did and, a, the, I think it's important to note that actually what we've done is look at existing levels of car ownership and that's yes. how we've created the zones, isn't it? So we're, yeah. we're simply through the new policy seeking to reflect existing patterns of car ownership whilst preventing any excessive levels. That's that's right. And we as part of that, we reviewed um, we effectively reviewed 12 hypothetical um, residential sites across the district. Um, looked at how much parking would be provided if we um, if we use the current minimum standards, um, even with accessibility discounts, and um, and basically it showed that the current standards in the in the placemaking plan results in higher levels of parking provided for development for residential developments than the actual ownership levels as as they are. Um, so we needed to review the standards so that we we, we aren't providing more parking than, than than people need under their current levels of, of ownership. Okay. Thanks, Chris. And I notice another question. I didn't answer fully Ian Bell's question. He also raised a query about whether we're reviewing the opening hours of the park and ride. I have to say, Ian, I, all I can speak for is my own part of the transport sector at Baines. And I can say that we aren't, but I will double check with um, my public transport colleagues. And if um, that answer differs any, I will let you know. We will, however, be considering, as Chris has explained, wholesale changes from park and rides to transport interchanges and amending the opening hours will be part of that consideration when the project gets going.
George, Dave, has any other questions come up that I haven't spotted? Uh, no, I don't think I can see any at the moment. Let no, no, come in then. George, have we got anything else that's come through from anybody or anything that was uh, submitted before the uh, before today or have we dealt with all of those? Uh, I think we've dealt with them all. Unless there are any, Chris, that you wanted to pick up on that just in addition to the presentation? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, obviously, as I said at the start of the, uh, of the uh, webinar, this has been recorded and it will go on the Council's uh, YouTube uh, page so you will be able to go back and look at it again and if uh, other questions do come up that you want answered then please feel free to uh, submit them to us and we will get answers to you. I did say again at the beginning that usually these webinars we find last between sort of 40, 45 to, minutes to an hour. Um, we're 40, nearly 45 minutes in at the moment. Now if there aren't any other questions and uh, we don't have anything else from the panel then uh, I suggest that um, we uh, end this webinar with a thanks to the people that have taken part and indeed to Councillor Tim Ball as uh, Leader of Planning and Licensing for attending. Is everybody happy with that? I think, Dave, it's also worth saying that there is a, um, the, the, the consultation on, on the website um, does give you chances to, um, to make um, more open comments on walking, cycling, travel plan, et cetera. All of the topic areas so there are chances to uh, to, to make um questions through that avenue as well yeah i think that's a very good point chris just to remind everybody i think the consultation finishes i think the 8th of october um please 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 if you do have any comments or suggestions or questions or anything get those in before the 8th of october because that is the cutoff date and after that they can't be addressed so you've got that period of time and if again you're interested in any of the other webinars that are on other topics please look on the Council's YouTube website where they'll all be posted up and you can view them at your leisure whenever you like. Dave, hey, I can pick up one or two bits and pieces. Yeah, of course. Um, and thanks very much for what we've done today, all the panellists as well. And those, those watching in, and those watching in on the recorded session on the YouTube later on, if any of you actually pick up an issue regarding this, please actually make a comment tell your friends to view this as well and your colleagues because they're essential to make sure we get delivery of a, of a good local plan parcel update and to ensure that delivery is what you actually want so please tell your friends about this point them to the actual youtube channel and what you've done today and what you've heard thank you yeah brilliant in which case thank you everybody thank you good afternoon thank Enjoy you. the rest of the day Bye. thank you